I have some, I, I guess you could call them radical views on Hall of Fames in that I, I think oftentimes we break down somebody's Hall of Fame worthiness bit by bit, right? Like if it's the Baseball Hall of Fame, you put, the, were they a Hall of Fame player? No. Were they a Hall of Fame manager? No. Or I will put the two together. For instance, Dusty Baker was a really good Major League Baseball player for a really long time and has been a really good manager for a really long time. Together, to me, Dusty Baker belongs in the Baseball Hall of Fame when it's all said and done for him. Or, and I don't know, you know, I don't, if Jim Harbaugh as a player in college football was worthy enough to be a college football Hall of Famer. I would say as a coach, he's worthy enough to be a college football Hall of Famer. You put them together, Jim Harbaugh is a college football Hall of Famer. And the reason the Hall of Fame is on my mind is that the Pro Football Hall of Fame last weekend had announced, hey, here's our class of 2024. And it got me thinking about the College Football Hall of Fame and its requirements, its standings, who is who is in the Hall of Fame, who's not in the Hall of Fame, who should be in the Hall of Fame. And to me, there's one gigantic snub. And, and it goes back to the, like, how do you how do you put together a Hall of Fame-worthy level of resume, right? Like, can you be a borderline Hall of Famer as a player, a borderline Hall of Famer as a coach? You put the two together, therefore, you are a Hall of Famer. I have that opinion, yes, that if you are... Uh, if you were a borderline Hall of Fame player and then a borderline Hall of Fame coach or whatever the case may be, or maybe you're a, a borderline Hall of Famer as a player and a Hall of Famer as a coach, like, should you go in as both? Yeah, I would venture to guess. Yeah. But that's just my stance on it. Um, I, and it's, it's the same for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Basketball Hall of Fame doesn't really matter because pretty much if you were like remotely good <laughs> in at any level of basketball, you get into the basketball hall of fame. Like if you were to look at some of the guys who are in the basketball hall of fame, and it's because it takes into account, not their college basketball careers, not their NBA careers, but their basketball careers. Then you get put into the basketball hall of fame. So I, I don't have a problem with some of those guys in there that were great college players were like role players in the NBA. But when you put it all together, like, are you one of the best to ever do it in this sport? Yeah. So when you look at the College Football Hall of Fame, there are some snubs. There are legitimate people that should be in the College Football Hall of Fame, and you're like, well, wait a second, how the hell do you win the Heisman Trophy and you're not in the College Football Hall of Fame when you are immediately eligible? That's neither here nor there. There is one specific person to me that technically doesn't meet the College Football Hall of Fame guidelines, doesn't meet the requirements, and I will pound the table that they deserve to be in the College Football Hall of Fame. As a coach, to be in the College Football Hall of Fame, you had to be a coach for a head coach for 10 years, coach at least 100 games, and have a winning percentage of 600. You have to win 60% of your games as a head coach to be even eligible to be inducted into the college football hall of fame. And it doesn't sound as if that's all that difficult, right? A decade as a head coach. And if you're successful, you're going to have barring some ridiculous unforeseen circumstances, you're going to have 10 years as a head coach. If you're successful, whether it's at one school, five schools, whatever the case may be, you're going to have that tenure coaching 100 games. Now, when you play 12 games plus a conference championship game, 13 games, plus a playoff semifinal and a, play, and a college football playoff national championship game, you are at 15 games, okay? So getting to 100 games, 10, 10 years, 100 games, 60%. Sounds, it, it makes sense. It's a baseline, like, hey, we got to have some requirements to get into this thing, right? So I don't have any qualms with that. I guess maybe I do. <laughs> I don't have any qualms with that in theory. But, Mike Leach meets all of those requirements except for one. Mike Leach's career winning percentage is 59.6. It's not 60%. So Mike Leach is not eligible for the College Football Hall of Fame. And I think it's a travesty because not only 
one, I think it the 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 requirement of winning sixty percent of your games operates under the guise that everybody in college football is equal, and they are not. And when you look at the programs that Mike Leach was the head coach of, Texas Tech, Washington State, Mississippi State, they all have the same thing in common, that they are all bottom feeders of their conference. They are all the underdogs. They are all the programs that you have to do something differently at those programs to have a chance to be successful. Because you know what? In the 1970s, Texas Tech, Washington State and Mississippi State lined up in the wishbone and tried to shove around guys from Texas and Florida and LSU and Alabama and Washington and USC. It doesn't go very well for them. So they have to do things differently. So Mike Leach winning 59% of his 59.6% of his games at Washington State, Texas Tech and Mississippi State is like somebody winning 85% of their games at Notre Dame. It's impressive that he accomplished, that he got to 59.6. So that is my, I think my biggest gripe is that, and, and he, he died as a head coach. He was, he was, he had more years ahead of him. He had more time to tally more wins to get to 60%. He died as an active head coach. If he had said, you know what, if he had if he had coached for another decade and he retired when he was 71 instead of dying when he was 61, I, and he retired and said, you know what, I didn't get to 60%, that's, you know, that's on me. I had an extra decade to do it and I never did it. I don't think you can argue that. He died as an active head coach. So I think you should take some of that into consideration, even if you're just to say, you know what, we're going to round up 59.6% to 600. If you're going to round up 0.59622641, yada, 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 to 600, I don't think anybody complains about that. The guy died an active head coach. He obviously had more in front of him. But then also, and this goes back to, I think, the combo conversation, right? That maybe technically, legally, by your requirements, does he meet the eligibility to, for the College Football Hall of Fame? No. But as an ambassador of the game, as an innovator of the game, as a contributions to the game of college football, I don't know that you will find anyone who will tell you that Mike Leach is not a huge contributor to modern college football. I don't think you can argue that. And is that worth a half a percentage point? <laughs> to me, yes. Absolutely, unequivocally. No doubt about it. But there's, I don't even think you can make an argument that Mike Leach hasn't been in the 21st century. One of, if not the biggest contributor to advancing the sport of college football. Is that worthy of being inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame? That alone, to me, is yes. That's worthy of being inducted in the College Football Hall of Fame. Coupled that with, you won 158 games at Texas Tech, Washington State, and Mississippi State. And died as an active head coach. It feels as if that's a no-brainer. It feels as if it's really simple for the people, the, the big wigs who wear the like $3,000 suits at the College Football Hall of Fame, the gatekeepers of the sport, to get their heads out of their asses for about 15 seconds and go, is Mike Leach, when can you tell the history of college football without Mike Leach? I don't know that you can, I don't know that you can argue that you could from about 2005 on. Because... Damn near every offense today is some version of what Mike Leach brought, helped innovate, and popularize in the mid-2000s, in the early to mid-2000s. Virtually everything that isn't Iowa or a service academy is built on concepts, built on schemes, that he helped create, diversify, 
invent, popularize, and teach to other people. And that's a, that's a really big deal because the sport's popularity has grown with the offensive explosion that it has seen. That when the NFL started taking things from college and not the other way around, or colleges started taking things from high schools, that and, and it, it, there's it, it's always you know a copycat or it's always finding the next thing. Mike Leach was doing this stuff at like the NAIA level, and people were ripping it off because it made sense, it worked, and now it's. Like So I'm 34 years old. When I was even 16 to 18, when I was in high school even, it still was not uncommon for a large portion of college football offenses to play with a tight end and a fullback at virtually all times. That shotgun was what you did when it was third and long. It wasn't a every. It wasn't an every down formation, and then it, 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 and it's simple. And it's but but you had to take somebody like the air raid offense that Mike Leach helped invent, invigorate, popularize, is simple in what it's trying to accomplish in what the philosophy is. It just took somebody to buck somewhat conventional wisdom. Mike Leach does that. Does that? Did that? It just takes somebody to butt conventional wisdom and think about things a different way to lead to an offensive explosion that radicalized college football. And so over the course of the last 15 years, over the course of the last 20 years in the sports history, can you tell the history of college football without Mike Leach's influence, contributions, no, no, you can't. So are those contributions worth a point worth six tenths of a percentage point? I think, yeah. And I don't I don't know that anybody would argue against. One, I think it's a special circumstance, right? And so you can the College Football Hall of Fame can steadfastly say, like, hey, these are our requirements. Sorry, not changing them for somebody. Special circumstance. Guy dies as an active head coach. Less than half of uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, less than less than a half a percentage point from being eligible for your Hall of Fame. And also is one of the fathers of the offense that now dominates the sport. If this had happened in 1960 and one of the, and Daryl Royal had died from a heart attack before he had got to a 600 win percentage. But he had helped develop the wishbone offense that everybody in the sport then ran for the next, I guess not everybody, but damn near everybody in the sport ran for the next 20 years. The most successful teams in the sport ran for the next 20 years. You, you can't argue with, one, the contribution, but then also like, hey, this is a special circumstance. This is not your run-of-the-mill candidacy, resume, whatever the case may be. This is different. And I don't think anybody would argue that. I don't know that who, whether it's popular or just right, whether anybody, nobody argues it because you don't want to be the guy who's arguing against the Hall of Fame candidacy for a dead guy, but also because it's just the right decision that Mike Leach deserves to be in a college football Hall of Fame. I don't think anybody's arguing that because it's real. It's the truth. It's what people believe. It's that guy deserves to be enshrined is one of the most important figures in the game's history. And I, I don't know that you can lead a crusade for that, but when push comes to shove, is Mike Leach the biggest college football playoff, or co not college football playoff, college football hall of fame snub? Yeah. Yeah, he is. And I don't really think it's close. Now it, it might be, there, there are some dudes that definitely 100% have a case that have every reason to believe I should be in the College Football Hall of Fame too, whether it's player, coach, whatever. Mike Leach deserves a spot in that Hall of Fame. And I'll I'll pound the table on that 
that even before the 59.62% winning percentage when you require a 600, you know what? That's close enough for somebody who died as an active head coach, but then put in the contributions to the game caveat on it. It's a slam dunk open and shut case that I don't think is all that difficult to make. That'll do it for today's episode of the Daily Huddle. Appreciate you making us a part of your day, however it is, wherever it is you're doing so. Whether you're watching us here on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Make sure you get all that great college football content. Or if you're listening on a podcast feed, drop a five-star review. It goes really a long way in helping out the channel. See you tomorrow right here on the Daily Huddle with Saturday Glory.